Hello, my name's Sue Allen, and I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you, um, having been invited by the University of Cumbria, to talk to you about Marineets and Bridewains, contemporary commentaries on folk music in the Lake Counties during the Romantic period. The title of the talk is based on, and the content, based on my chapter in the new Routledge Companion to English Folk Performance, which comes out this July. Um, and first of all, I think we need a few definitions from that title. A merry meet, what is it? It's originally a social gathering organized by the publican of a country inn over the Christmas period, with food and dance and music and cards for the older people. And it later came to be used as a general term for evening of dancing and music. Bridewain, on the other hand, is a wedding, a country wedding, sometimes known as a bidden wedding because the groom's friends would ride round the countryside and invite all the neighbors to the wedding. Uh, and there'd be sports, feasting, music and dance and at the end of the evening, the bride sat with a large bowl to collect donations from everyone present. So it made sense to invite lots of people. Folk music uh, is altogether more difficult, sometimes called vernacular or traditional music. All the terms are problematic and there is no one agreed definition. But suffice to say, it's not related to its origin. Um, so it can be a printed form or by a known composer, but it's more to do with what the folk do with it. They pass it on, they play it, they sing in face-to-face -face situations, and it's basically a non-commercial form of music. Lake Counties of the title is, of course, Cumberland, Westmoreland, the Furness district of Lancashire, and that tiny bit of the Yorkshire Dales around Sether and Dent. Uh, and the Romantic period I'm talking about is roughly from mid 18th to mid 19th century. And it's going to have two parts, this talk. The first one will talk about the commentaries and observations of land surveyors, visitors and late poets, whilst the second is going to look at the regional dialect poets and what they had to say about music, dance and song. First, a little bit about me before we get into the body of the talk. I'm Cumbrian born and bred with a background in performing and researching Cumbrian folk music. My PhD thesis was on folk song in Cumbria. And recently I've contributed a number of chapters in Cumbrian music to recent books. They're all down the, um, the side of the page there. And also um, a book of my own last year on Carlisle poet Robert Anderson. And in addition to all that, I also write for Cumbria Life magazine. My research into folk song revealed about 500 folk songs, many in multiple versions, including border ballads, broadside ballads, which were printed versions on cheap paper sold at markets and fairs, um, are there generally popular songs which gained currency among the folk, but also two very distinct regional repertoires? And that was hunting songs and songs in dialect, which make up almost a quarter of the total number of songs. Apart from songs, there is a great tradition of Lakeland fiddlers, many of whom also travelled about as dancing masters. And we're very fortunate in some of these fiddlers left us their manuscript tune books. So we've got all these tunes from the period roughly, as I say, mid 18th to mid 19th century. And in terms of dance, there are social dances done at Merry Neats and Bridewains, plus Morris sword and clog dances. And I also will bring in just a little bit something to do with folk customs, like Merry Neats, Bridewains are two of them, but also we'll look at rush bearing. Now the Lake, the Lake District Romanticism and Romantic Antiquarianism. Well, this, this sets the scene. Interest in the picturesque and the advent of Romanticism in the late 18th century brought many visitors to the Lake District to view not only its dramatic landscapes, 
but also in a few cases to look at, to observe the manners and customs of the inhabitants. And this reportage, together with that of the region's dialect poets, it provides valuable insights into what was being played, sung and danced. And it also we find that this music enhances an already strong regional identity. The romantic movement and the birth of the Lake District tourism sector also promoted a wider interest in the North, driving a keen antiquarian interest in Northern ballads. And perhaps the most famous collection of these, which certainly did inspire the Lake poets, and Wordsworth in particular, was Thomas Percy's Relics of Old English Poetry, which was a collection of old ballads from the um, 16th century onwards. Um, this was all part of the romantic antiquarian quest, well, the romantic quest really of the discovery of the people, a quest for authenticity as revealed in the lives of ordinary people as being examples perhaps of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's noble savage and finding the essential qualities in low and rustic life, as it was termed, was part of the romantic project. Artless and wild became terms of praise and were perfectly embodied in the figure of Mary of Buttermere, who became known as the Beauty of Buttermere, who you see depicted here. Um, she was made famous or perhaps notorious by the writings of Joseph Palmer and attracted the attention of the Lake poets and indeed the rest of the country. I haven't time to go into all her story here, sadly. Um, the early commentators who mention um, dances and music were those who were traveling the county as land surveyors or agriculturalists, partly because this was a period of agricultural reform and music is very much an important part of the celebrations punctuating the farming year. Uh, James Clark, um, a surveyor from Penrith, he, he said of the people of Carlisle, for example, that the women must be hardy souls if you judge them by the dare depictions in border ballads, Jock of the Side, Hobby Noble and Dick of the Cow. And he also makes mention, intriguingly, of a Cumberland sword dance. He notes that farming in the region, particularly in the lakes, was a communal culture with neighbours cooperating at peak times ploughing, sheep shearing, mowing, harvesting, in what were known as boon days. And work and play followed the seasons with early summer bringing boon clippings, so sheep shearings, autumn corn suppers, and at the end of the year, shepherd's meat. And each of these would have their celebrations afterwards, including music. The twice yearly hiring fairs were also very important. They were when the farm servants would be hired for a new term of six months and they were held at Martinmas and at Whitsuntide. But they were huge events, social events in the rural calendar because they were one of the only places that young people could get to meet the opposite sex and have a good time together. Um, John Hausman, another land surveyor, in his topographical description of 1800, which is the bottom of the page there, um, notes what happens at the hiring fair in a market town. When the boys and girls have been hired, the work of the day is finished, so they head off to the local inn and each inn had a dancing master and a fiddler. The people there attend to exertion and agility more than ease and grace. Minuets and country dances constitute no part of the amusements of these rural assemblies. Indeed, these dancing parties often exhibit scenes very indelicate and unpleasant to the peaceful spectator. No order is observed and the anxiety for dancing is great. One couple can only dance at the same time with perhaps half a dozen couples waiting around to take a floor. The young men busy in paying addresses to their partners and half intoxicated forget who they're supposed to dance with next. A dispute arises 
The fiddler offers his mediation to no avail. Nay, the interference of an angel would have been spurned at. Blood and fury, it must be decided by a fight, which immediately ensues. William Dickinson, who was a local um, farmer turned antiquarian and dialect writer, right, describes the feasting after a boon clipping in a long dialect poem he wrote about the farming year. And he says that after the food, somebody nettles on table. He says, lads, you man, join in my son. Here's a good health to the man of the house, the man of the house, the man of the house. Here's a good health to the man of the house, for he is a right honest man. And this old clipping song, he says, often degenerated into a raucous drinking game as it progressed, often followed by songs, Oh, good ale, thou art my darling, the raven and the rock starling, and tarry woo, tarry wool, which was traditionally sung by the shepherds. Speaking of shepherds, the other photographs here, well, the bottom one features a uh, sheep clipping, and the other two are at the most famous um, popular shepherd's meat site, which is the Dunball in Mardale, which is, of course, a valley now drowned and is occupied by horse water. And at this sheep shepherds meet, there'd be sports like wrestling and horse racing, there'd be judging of dogs and sheep, and there would also be much singing in the pub afterwards. Now, this music in the community is to be expected. We would expect that most of these celebrations would include an element of music, but it comes as a little bit more of a surprise to find that music education was actually quite widespread. And Thomas Sanderson, the schoolmaster poet who lived at Kirk Linton, north of Carlisle, in his essay on the characters, manners and customs of the peasantry of Cumberland, he reports about visits to his village of both a singing and a dancing master. Church music, he says, generally composes a large part of the education of a Cumbrian peasant. They're instructed in it by the parish clerk or by some itinerant professor, and in the course of a few months, by the means of a good ear and a tunable voice, acquire as much skill in it as to be able to gratify the taste of a country audience. When the school breaks up, they who compose the choir and he who leads it have generally a ball at the village alehouse in order to experience joys of a more terrestrial nature. Most of the Cumbrian peasantry, he also says, are taught to dance by some itinerant teacher with more merit in his heels than his head. The puritanical Sanderson, a bachelor, disapproves but reluctantly has to admit that dancing is popular amongst the higher as well as the lower classes of the community. So that to censor it would probably be to incur the charge of puritanical austerity. But I should think the time and money expended in acquiring this art might be more usefully applied. Life is too short to waste any portion of it in frivolous amusements. Back at Fish Inn in Buttermere, meanwhile, which is where Mary Beauty of Buttermere lives, and that's her waiting on table, as depicted by Gilray. Um, he does a return trip to Buttermere, which he published in his fortnight's ramble in the lakes, intended as a, a light-hearted guide to tourists. This was in the winter of 1797 to eight. On arrival at the Fish Inn, he's delighted to learn that there's going to be a dance that night. A benefit of one Askew, a blind fiddler of Whitehaven, a great favourite with the Cumberland lads and lasses. Here's dinner with the fiddler, and he's waited on by Mary, and later heads upstairs to watch the dancing. Same. They were the very rosiest cheeked mortals I ever saw. The men kept excellent time and rattled on the floor with a variety of steps. The women danced as easily as the men determinedly. And I was glad to notice a black eyed youth hand out Mary and another girl and call for a reel. 
And I honestly say I never saw more graceful dancing or a woman of finer figure to set it off than in Mary of Buttermere. On the way north to Cumberland, Palmer and his companion stop off at the Eagle and Child Inn in Heversham in South Lakes, Westmoreland as it was. And noticing 30 boys and girls assembly for dancing lessons in the barn next door, they sneak in to watch. One of the boys danced a hornpipe, he says, with hat aside and stick under his arm, tipping most vehemently with heel and toe, but in very good time. Nine girls danced a cotillion in time and step that would not have disgraced a ballroom. And what had a singular and rustic effect while they were going round the circle in pairs, the odd number stepped into the centre, pulled a red rose from her breast, which she held up as she danced round and led to another step. He says then, why should so innocent a dance be called a cotillion? I think it ought to have an English name. Where is the harm then in naming it the Rose Dance? So there's your dancing school in Heversham. But the most famous dancing school has to be the one that John Keats wrote about in the village of Iaby in the Northern Fells. At the Sun Inn where he stayed with his friend Charles Armitage Brown in summer 1818 while they were on a tour of the North. He wrote, he documented the tour in letters to his brother Tom and says in a letter at the end of June um, that after a walk up Skiddle, they turned up in IAB and were most amused by the dancing school at the Sun Inn in the village. It was indeed no new cotillion, fresh from France. No, they whirled it and twirled it and jump it with metal extraordinary and whisk it and frisked it and flecked it and towed it and goaded it and twirled it and wheeled it and stamped it and sweated it, tattooing the floor like mad. The difference between our country dance and these Scotch figures is about the same as leisurely, leisurely stirring a cup of tea and beating up a battered pudding. I was extremely gratified to think that if I had pleasures they knew nothing of, they also had some into which I could not possibly enter. I hope I shall not return without having got the Highland fling. The line about no new cotillion is actually a quote from Robert Burns's Tam O'Shanter. And the lines are also quoted by Keats's companion, Charles Brown, who at a later date writes his own account of the dancing school in a local paper. Folks here were as partial to dancing as their neighbors, the Scotch. And every little farmer sent his young ones to take lessons. We went upstairs to witness the skill of these rustic boys and girls, fine, healthy, clean dressed and withal perfectly ordered as well as serious in their endeavors. The instant the fiddle struck up, the slouch in the gate was lost, the feet moved, and gracefully with complete conformity to the notes, they wove the figure, sometimes extremely complicated to my inexperienced eyes, without an error or the slightest pause. There was no sauntering, half asleep country dance among them, all were inspired. Meanwhile, in that central point of the Romantic Lakes, Grasmere, Dorothy Wordsworth also mentions the local dancing master in her area, which is James Lishman. Um, and she mentions him in a letter to her friend Lady Beaumont while she's on a tour of Scotland and when she goes to see a dancing display there where she says the dancing would not have disgraced the Ambleside quality children at Mr. Lishman's ball. And you can see there a picture of a poster of a Mr. Lishman's ball, albeit not in Grasmere, but this one, or Ambleside, but this one in Keswick. End of season, uh, Williams, no, Williams children, before I go on to the end of season balls. William's children would undoubtedly have attended these lessons 
And in a letter dated Christmas 1805, Dorothy describes her niece and nephew in the kitchen at Dove Cottage, saying, according to annual custom, our Grasmere fiddler is going his rounds and all the children in the neighboring houses are assembled in the kitchen to dance. Johnny has long talked of the time when the fiddler was come, but he was too shy to dance with anyone but me. Uh, as I was starting to say rather too quickly, end of season balls is where the children would perform the steps they'd learnt for their parents. And one particular ball in Grasmere is described by the writer John Wilson, perhaps better known to some as Christopher North, who for a number of years lived at Ellery in Windermere. The one he goes to is one his children were attending and his long poem, The Children's Dance, describes the goings on there. And although he frames the children somewhat typical romantic and sentimental fashion, as paragons of innocence and purity, his descriptions are very lively. And lo, the crowded ballroom is alive with restless motion and a honey humming noise like on a warm spring morn, a sunny hive, when round the queen, the waking bees rejoice. Sweet blends with graver tones, the silvery voice of children rushing eager to their seats. The master, proud of his fair flock, employs his guiding beck that due attention meets. List through the silent room, its anxious bosom, beats, children all being incredibly nervous about performing. The dancing master, he says, is no idle, worthless, wandering man, but hardworking, patient and well-liked, a welcome guest in every cottage on hill and vale. His tunes and skillful playing are referred to as Scottish. This seems to be a common failing, but then Wilson was Scottish. A stirring sound that makes the living bow leap dancing or the strings. Even William Wordsworth, who's not given generally to describing the social or partaking in the um, social life of the pe working people around him, does mention Christmas waits in the preface to the Dudden Sonnets. Christmas waits went round from house to house, usually Christmas morning, could be Christmas Eve, could be New Year's Eve, and they would play a particular tune called Hums Up Through the Woods. And they would then call to eat out the name of each member of the household in turn and wish them all a Merry Christmas. And Christmas was not thought to have started until that had happened. The minstrels played their Christmas tune tonight beneath my cottage eaves while smitten by the lofty moon through hill and vale, every breeze had sunk to rest with folded wings. Keen was the air, but could not freeze nor check the music of the strings. So stout and hardy were the band that scraped the chords with strenuous hand. Words with even features a merry neat, will be very briefly, in his poem, The Wagoner, where we find Benjamin the Wagoner on a trip from uh, Grasmere to Keswick, stopping off at the Cherry Tree Inn at Withburn, which is Thelmere. Um, you can see Withburn water there illustrated, because uh, he hears the sound of the fiddle and it's the village merry neat. The dancing, as in Vladimir, is going on upstairs. What thumping stumping overhead, the thunder had not been more busy. With such a stir, you would have said this little place may well be dizzy. Tis who can dance with greatest vigour, tis what can be most prompt and eager. As if it heard the fiddle's call, the pewter clatters on the wall, the very bacon shows its feeling swinging from the smoky ceiling. Um, there's a pattern forming, isn't there here, of, of dancing owing a lot more to um, energy uh, and vigour uh, than to grace. And so it was a Grasmere rush bearing as a big celebration after the event. The rush bearings um, 
there were many more of them in Cumbria, but the two largest, two most prominent, and that possibly the two that went on longest were Grasmere and the one at Ambleside. There are other villages who still have much simpler ceremonies, uh, but Grasmere is indeed the most famous, largely due to um, Wordsworth. Um, you can see picture there from 1901 to five, it says, so early 20th century. And that's a photograph I took at the Rush Bearing in 2018, the other one. A writer called TQM, identified later as Robert Story, was a contributor to Holmes' table book, an antiquarian miscellany of interesting bits and bobs. In 1827, he gives an account of the celebrations at Grasmere. The children, mostly girls, go off onto the fells, gather rushes, and then parade their garlands through the village to the tune played by the band. And then in the church, the queen places a large garland on the pulpit while the rest strew rushes on the floor. Afterwards, the local fiddler, Billy Dawson, escorts a procession to the Red Lion Inn where the evening is spent in all kinds of rustic merriment, he says. In the procession, I observed the opium eater, Thomas Quincy, of course, Mr. Barber, an opulent gentleman residing in the neighborhood, Mr. and Mrs. Wordsworth, Miss Wordsworth, and Miss Dora Wordsworth. Wordsworth is the chief supporter of these rural ceremonies. Later, at the Red Lion, he comments that the country lads and lasses tripped it merrily and heavily. They call this amusing dancing, he says, I call it thumping. For he who could make the most noise seems to be esteemed the best dancer. And on the present occasion, I think Mr. Pooley, the schoolmaster, bore away the palm. He's also pleased to note, though, that the dancing room is the very one depicted by John Wilson in the children's dance. And he learns too that the dancing master in that poem was one John Carrados. The dancing continues till quarter to 12 when a lively, a, a liveried servant comes in to deliver a message to the fiddler. Master's respects, and he will thank you to lend him your fiddlestick. Billy took the hint. The Sabbath morn was at hand. So the servant departed with the fiddle bow by the time the village clock struck 12, not an individual was to be seen out of doors in the village. Now we're moving on to the second part of this talk, which concerns observations and commentaries and writings by what I call both vernacular and dialect poets. And um, this long, long list um, is just really to see to show you where they fit in chronologically with other writers. Um, the ones in bold are the vernacular poets. I call them vernacular poets because I don't like the term peasant poet. And I don't always call them dialect poets because almost all of them also wrote in standard English, often before they started to attempt dialect verse. So I use the terms interchangeably um, more properly vernacular, but sometimes it's easier just to say dialect poets if you're talking about a dialect poem. One of their favourite um, things to depict was bucolic festivities, celebratory occasions, people by a cast of characters who included dancers, fiddlers, and singers. And here we have a picture of one, though. I've included it because it's actually the painting's called Mr. Pickwick's Christmas or something like that, but it's painted by Robert Forrester, who was a Carlisle artist at the Metal Box Company in Carlisle, who painted this sort of picture for the tin, the lids of biscuit tins and the like. But Robert Forrester's grandfather was a country fiddler and Bob himself both sang and collected songs and so he was deeply involved with the folk music scene in Cumbria. So I thought it'd be nice to include his picture. Uh, reports of singing actually occur quite rarely in dialect literature. Dancing features more often, 
because it was a vital preliminary to courtship, which is why learning to dance was so important. Uh, hence the ubiquitous dancing masters, and we've mentioned Lishman and Caradus of Westmoreland. But in Cumberland, the dialect poets also reference the names of many others, including Jonathan Bramery, Tom Little, Tom Trimmel, Tommy Baxter, Bill Adams, and Ben Wells. In Ewan Clark's 1805 poem, The Rustic, written in standard English, not dialect, the local dancing master was Tom Little of Thursby, who for upwards of 40 years has figured in his vocation and exercised the heels of thousands. Who would not the attainment of the dance forego, nor need one buxom lass or sunburnt swain to foot and floor, to foot the floor by art unskilled remain. To accomplish this, itinerant artists will for weekly sixpence train them into skill, procure some empty barns, commodious sight, and there instruct each limb to move aright, to cross the buckle, thunder one, two, three, and bounce a hornpipe with agility, to run a reel, to jump jigs with an air, till all are finished for the wake or the fair. To thee, Tom Little, of elastic toe, to thee, through friendship, shall one couplet flow. Taught by their skill, have thousands risen to fame, if graceful dancing that distinction claim. The most famous, well, in this region, one of the best, and certainly the most prolific, dialect poets was Robert Anderson, who became known as the Cumberland Bard. Here's a bit of his biography, which is probably all you need to know for now. But it's important to note that um, he went to London in the late 18th century and started writing poetry when he came back. But in London, he wrote songs for the Vauxhall Gardens, having been quite disgusted with the standard of what were called Scotch songs there. And these were set to music by James Hook and published widely in cheap print productions for which were, um, Anderson got not a penny. Well, his first poetic effusion, as he called it, was Lucy Gray of Allendale, for which the music is there on the screen. And it is said by some scholars that Anderson's Lucy Gray uh, inspired Wordsworth's Lucy poems. His publications, as I said, he, were prolific. His first poetry collection, 1798, but his first, from our point of view, the most interesting, first production of dialect poetry was his Cumberland Ballads of 1805. And then in 1820, a two volume subscription edition of his poetical works in both standard English and a few poems in dialect was published with subscribers, including Saudi and Wordsworth. Um, and further editions of Cumberland ballads in various forms, sometimes with the work of other po poets, were published from 1808 right through the 19th century until 1904. As I said, the bridewains and weddings were raucous, <laughs> carnivalesque affairs, and dancing was an integral part of them. And Anderson wrote two notable rollicking poems about weddings. The Walton Wedding, which is actually Orton near Carlisle, the Codbeck Wedding called Beck in the Northern Fells. They certainly paint a lively picture. At Orton, we find the dancers described, or one of them, this way. Young sour milk sawney on the stool, a worn pipe danced and caved and pranced, and slipped and brack his left leg shin and helped set about. Then cock a woolly lap bark heat, he leapt roof beam height, and in his clogs top time did beat, but tame her in her stocking feet, she banged him out and out. Before long, there's a drunken fight, uh, and the fiddler John Stagg. Is in the firing line. I'm not sure, did I mention? The poet John Stagg was also a very popular um, uh, country fiddler, often in demand for weddings. And here he appears in 
Anderson's poem. Blin Stag the fiddler got a whack, the bear can fleek, film his back, and next the fiddlestick they brack. Twas wheelie wanny wah. Love that line. Twas wheelie wah oh wah. That is, it was just as well he wasn't any worse. In Colbeck, the dancing gets underway to another fiddler called Ogle Willie, about whom I know nothing. The bride would dance, coddle me cuddy, a well-known dance and tune of the time. A, threes a threesome then capered scotch reels. Peter Weir cleeked up with old Mary Dalton, like a cock a hen nest he steals. John Bell yelped out, so are me lasses. Young Joseph, a land country dance. He'd got his new pump, Smithson me at him, and fain would show how he could prance. Back to John Stagg, the Blin Bard. Sadly, not a Cumberland Bard, but he was known sometimes as the Cumbrian Minstrel. Born in Bruff by Sands, son of a carpenter, he was supposedly destined for the clergy, but became blind in childhood. Um, and for a while ran a, a, a circulating library in Wigton, but spent most of his life in Manchester. Married, had about 13 children, um, but never managed to make a money from from any money from his writing, ended up in the workhouse back in Cumbria. Um, and you'll note there I've put 18, his 1810 Minstrel of the North, which went into various editions, is very important. Um, it includes uh, mostly songs in, and ballads in standard English and just a few dialect poems, but it also is the first po reference in poetry in English to a vampire by name in his pseudonymous poem, The Vampire with a Y. So I think that's quite important to note. His dialect masterpiece was undoubtedly the 49 stanzas of the Bridewain, which concerns a wedding on the Solway Plain, to which guests from 10 or 12 parishes are lated or fetched or invited. And after the wedding ceremony at the church, the men have a race on horseback to the bride's house where there's food and copious quantities of ale. The fiddlers, Tom Trimmel, Tommy Baxter, and lo and behold, John Stagg himself, are already tuning up and rosling their bows before striking up Cuddy's wedding, a popular slip jig. After the usual sports of horse racing, wrestling, jumping and gambling, eating, drinking, dancing begin, and intermitt intermittent fighting, it has to be said. Well into the night, he says, Lang serve kievel danced and sang. As the company with three with jigs and three reels capered, mauled yell and punch flew round like mad. The fiddlers are got fuddled, and money a lad their sweethearts had in corners huddled unseen that night. And as the day dawns, the fiddlers in the parlour begin fighting. And just as the sun was peeping, Stab depicts himself making his own way home, off waking and off sleeping. And as a notable poet who also wrote much in standard English was Mark Lonsdale. He was also a playwright, a songwriter, and sometime manager at Sadler's Wells in London. Um, so deaf, this is why I do not like calling these people peasant poets. It, they're not. <laughs> Um, an upshot, he explains, is mainly a summer event as opposed to a merry neat. And also the other difference is that a merry neat's a commercial venture got up by an innkeeper, whereas an upshot's organised by a young men in a village for their own amusement, usually in a, par a farmer's local barn or loft. The poem opens with the autumn lads planning the event and debating which fiddler to employ. Jonathan Brammery or John Stagg. They plump in the end for Br Brammery, even though he was less famed for his skill in tormenting Catgut, as for his knack of making himself the butt of jokes and pranks, as well as for his party piece, Hunting the Fox, described as a duet between voice and instrument depicting the instance of the chase, complete with sound effects. 
When the dancing gets going, it is, of course, energetic. We would expect nothing less. With the lads spinning the lasses round till they get dizzy. And the dancing master, Tom Little, we a fearful breed, got hold of Dinah Glaister. She danced a famous jig, and he was thought to be dancing master. But just as Little gave a span, a spring, like a fine squaw in Callan, a gesturing youth, the translation says, loft boards they brack, and there he stuck, stuck, a striddling cock of the hallen. Floorboards broke, and he ended up astride of the wooden partition called Hallen on the floor below. Ouch. At 10 o'clock, the party's in full swing, when a pistol shot's heard outside, and a party of maskers burst in to perform what appears to be a mummy's play and a sword dance. Um, I've put some pictures up here of mummies and sword dancers. They're not specific to Cumbria. In fact, there are very few who are, but I thought it was interesting to point out because some people might be thinking of a Scottish sword dance on crossed swords on the ground. This is not, this is swords held hilt and point, and then figures are woven and the swords are woven to a knot, which is, or a star, which is being held up by the dancers from Grenoside in the picture below. Um, the, the drawing, the engraving of the, of the sword dance there is, is a Buick, by the way. One of the main characters is a cross-dressing figure called Bessie, who's really a man. Oh, Bessie swirled and skewed a boat while folk to the skemmels brattled. And lasses willy lilty doubt as if they had betrattled, but maester in a man on lap just like a divil ranty. And broke man Jack, we busy gap, and Neddy Tarn and Lanty, which one can only assume must be the characters of the play. I don't recognise them actually. Read uncut figures, did they cut? Uncut, uncouth. And I they skimmed and chanted, their spans and vapours passed for wit. And that was all they wanted. Brammery, the fiddler, meanwhile, has fallen asleep in the fireplace. So the lads burn his wig and dirty his face and waken him with their laughter. But he goes back to sleep. And the fire party finally breaks up in the early hours. Old Brammery, Brammery, still asleep, is described as drunk as muck. I think towards the end here, we had the Bridewain as the wedding to end all weddings. This is the Merry Night, the Merry Neat, to end all Merry Nights. And it's Anderson's description, it seems to be from life, don't know, of a Merry Neat at the White Ox Blackwell, which is now uh, a suburb of Carlisle. It was then a separate village known as Blackwell. Um, and it took place on New Year's Eve in 1802. The opening verses set the scene. It became popular as a song, I should say, for the next 120 years, it was popular as a song. And it opens thus, so I'd better sing it, hadn't I? I lad second morning eight, we were a black hole. The sun as a fiddle yet rings in me here. All reclipped and hailed were the lads and the lasses. And money a clef, cleverish hissy was there. The better we saw it, they sat snug at the parlour. In his pantry, the sweet heart is cut it so soft. The dancers, they stored up a store in the kitchen. But the lamp of the card lake sat in the loft. You usually find the old people playing cards, a game called Lanta. The clogger of Dalston, meanwhile, is declared, declared a famous top hero and stamping with his feet and shouting till the sweat ran off his chin end as he shows off his clock on steps, ending with a flourish. He held up his hand like the spout of a teapot and danced across the buckle and led a patch. When they cried bonny bell, he lap up to the ceiling and I slapped his thumbs for a bit of a fratch. And the party continues in like fashion with much mirth and merriment singing, food, drink and ale, 
finally breaking up around five o'clock on New Year's morning as the drunken revelers wend their bleary-eyed way home. If you can hear some background noise, by the way, I have a skylight in this room and it is pouring on it. So I apologize for that if it interferes. So that is that. Um, I'd just like to end with a few final thoughts. Um, the influence of Romanticism, poets, the antiquarians, the interest in the North generally and the opening up of the lakes to tourism, fed into and influenced the writings of these vernacular poets who chronicled the life and leisure of rural Cumbria in both standard English and dialect. Dialect poetry is it's a complex sign. Its significance is less about accurate representation or recreation of the speech of the past, and it's much more to do with invoking in its audience nostalgia for the past, for perhaps a mythical golden age of the countryside, and for the poets and the audience's use. It also has a role in foregrounding regional identity, promoting a sense of place and a sense of belonging. But a note of caution, it's very tempting to think that the lively narrative poems of Stag Anderson and Lonsdale represent a faithful social history. We also need to remember that these writers were very skillful at creating atmosphere, theater, and a good story, all tended to, to romanticize their youth and their Cumbrian roots and in addition, were keenly aware of their intellectual capital as peasant poets. And were keen to merchandise or monetize popular pastoral tropes in an attempt to make money, to make a living if they could, none did, from, from their writing. But yet, their work was not pure invention but rather fiction grounded in fact. And it was lent an air of authenticity by the way that they named real fiddlers and interwove genuine tunes, dances and songs of the period into their work. So finally, I believe that the observations and commentaries by the surveyors, the visitors to the Lake District, the Lake poets and the vernacular poets are very valuable they're perhaps unique and exist only because of the heightened focus on this particular region during the Romantic era. I think of them as slightly fuzzy snapshots viewed through the prism of nostalgia and romanticism and providing us with rare and very precious glimpses of, of the musical lives of ordinary people living and working in the Lake Counties so thank you for listening and I would very much welcome your questions and observations. My email address is on the screen there, um, along with the two books that I'm trying to sell. <laughs> um, but enough of words for now. Thank you for coming. But I'd like to leave you with some music if I can. I'm hoping this plays, fingers crossed. Um, what I hope this will be is a tune from the 19th century Lakeland fiddler, William Irwin from El to Water, his hornpipe, Keswick Bonnie Lasses, played by fiddler Carolyn Francis and the band called Striding Edge. <laughs>